So I've developed a little bit of a few Veep plugins as I've gone along. I've done a lot of static site generation and I've built like, rebuilt Storybook a few different times. And most of those things usually come down to I need to make a very intense plugin for the system. And the one thing that kind of trips me up a lot of the time is the plugin API for uh, Veep is the same as uh, Rollup, but it only has a select few hooks. And I feel like those hooks are probably excluded because we have like speed concerns in the mix. With the advent of roll down, will we see the plugin API start to open up a little bit? Mm -hmm. Will the speed unlock more power that we can give to plugin devs? I'm curious, what are the hooks you were looking for but doesn't work in Beat? There's just like a hand, like four or five of them that like I've always oh. want to use, but they just don't run in dev mode because they're not there. Uh, yeah, just wondering, Will the new power expand to more stuff for us to do? So it's this is an interesting one because so first of all, with Rowdown and in a future version of Veet, Dev and Prod will become more consistent. They will be using the same plugin pipeline, and it'll so Dev plugin pl the plugins will work exactly the same between Dev and Prod. But the interesting part about having JavaScript plugins running in a Rust-based tool is there is the overhead of sending data back and forth between the two languages because they don't share memory by default. So in most cases, when you send things across a wire, you have to clone them in memory. And that's probably one of the biggest bottleneck for speed. So let's say if you use raw rowdown without any JavaScript plugins to bundle 20,000 modules, it can do it in 600 milliseconds. But if you add a couple JavaScript plugins, you can slow it down by maybe two to three times. This is directly correlated to the number of modules because we have to, for every hook of every plugin, you have to call it once for every module. So let's say you have a plugin with three hooks, then we're doing 60,000 Rust to JS calls. And that's not cheap. E even if you don't do anything in a hook, it's still quite a bit of a cost, right? So we're looking for ways to optimize that. So first of all, base layer compatibility is we want all the existing V plugins to be able to continue to work the same way. Uh, it might compromise the, the ideal performance to a certain extent, but let's make things work first, right? And then the next step is uh, for Vite itself internally, we've actually already ported some of the Vite internal logic over to Rust. Right now it's only for product for builds. So when you do the production build, you can enable the native equivalent of some Vite internal plugins. So that allows us to essentially get Yeet build speed down to maybe two to two point two and a half times slower than raw rowdown without any JavaScript plugins, which I think is actually decent. And in fact, that's already on par with other pure Rust bundlers. And then we are doing a few things to essentially there there are two two different ways you can think about this. One is reduce unnecessary Rust to JS calls. Right. So in uh, in typical Rust rollup plugins, we do a lot of things like in the transformer hook, we look at the ID. If the ID ends with a certain extension, we do this. Otherwise, we just return early. This is actually wasteful if you are you're using the plugin in a Rust bundler because the the bundler essentially do does a Rust to JS call, figure out it actually doesn't need to do anything, but it already paid the cost. Right. This is why ES builds plugin actually requires to have a filter outright before it is ever applied. And we're going to essentially introduce something similar. Uh, so it's going to be an extension on top of the current rollups and packs. It's going to be compatible because when you use the object format for your hooks, uh, so you specify a logic in the handler property, and then you can have a filter property to say, only apply this hook if the ID matches this regex or something like that. We can essentially determine whether this hook even needs to be called for a certain module before we even call it. So we don't even need to cross the Rust to JS bridge. That's one thing. The other thing is we're seeing a lot of plugins in the wild doing very similar things. For example, in the transform hook, a lot of plugins take the incoming source code, parse it using a JavaScript parser in, in the hook and then do their own like semantic analysis or AST traversal, and then use something like magic string to uh, alter the code and generate a new code, and also need to generate the, the source map and then pass it back to the bundler 
So a lot of work done in JavaScript, not leveraging the Rust parts. And then also the Rust needs to now need to take the source map and do the source imagine. And source maps are also quite heavy to pass across the, the boundary because it's bigger objects than source code. Right. So we're designing, trying to design APIs to essentially make this kind of standard ASD-based simple transforms to, to be as efficient as possible. So imagine instead of getting the string of the code, you actually get the pre-parsed AST directly. And instead of generating, manipulating the code and generating the source map in the JS side, you still do the same kind of magic string-like operations. Say, append some code here, remove the code here. But these operations are buffered and send as very compact instructions back to Rust. And the heavy lifting of code manipulation, string manipulation, and source map generation is actually done by Rust on the Rust side. Right. So the only work you're doing on the JS side really is looking at the AST and uh, record the operations you want to do and then tell the Rust side to do it. So I think this, in fact, covers can cover a very wide range of custom transform needs, right? Uh, because like we're actually able to build views, single file component transform entirely using this model in JavaScript, right? And if we get this API natively from the bundler, then we can actually offload a lot of the heavy lifting to the Rust toolchain instead of doing it in JavaScript. And I don't even need to install a, a parser dependency myself. So this is the, the second part of it. And then if we go a bit deeper, that's, this is further down the line. We're also investigating whether it's possible to send ASTs from Rust to JavaScript as little memory cost as possible. So this is something called like zero cost tra AST transfer. Using, theoretically, it's already possible using a shared array buffer. And then we need some, we need a custom deserializer on the JavaScript side that understands the memory layout and be able to like lazily read the AST from the flat array buffer as you need, right? One of our team members, Overlook Motel, actually has a proof of concept of this working already. But getting this properly into AFC uh, is going to be quite challenging. So this is something we're eventually going to do down the road, but the proof of concept shows that this is possible, right? And there are some exciting things in the JavaScript specs. For example, uh, there's a share structs uh, proposal. That's, that's quite new. That's still stage one. But it also is exciting if you can use share structs to essentially sh properly share state across worker threads and maybe Rust, right? So this, what this unlocks is proper parallelization of JavaScript plugins. Right now, when you use JavaScript plugins with a Rust bundler, because the JavaScript plugin still runs in Node.js process, it's still single-threaded, right? One thing we've done is trying to use multiple worker threads to parallelize the workload. But the downside of this is, for example, if the plugin uses a heavy dependency like Babel, each worker thread needs to initialize with Babel and allocate the memory for it. And in a lot of cases, it ends up that the gain is smaller than you might think because it's like the initializing cost of each worker thread just like offsets so much of the performance gains you get. It's challenging. There are some things we played around with. For example, instead of spawning the worker threads through a Node.js main process and then get the data back and then send it back to Rust, we let the worker threads directly send the data back to Rust. I think some of this might be useful, but applying them blindly for every plugin may not end up being as beneficial as we think. There's still a lot of work that we're exploring in this area, but I'm optimistic that, or a long-term goal for us is to tackle this, still allow users to easily write JavaScript plugins, but without severely compromising the overall performance of the system.